Um, she said, my name is Adam Semft. I'm a researcher at the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, uh, and I'm here to present one of the projects of the Citizen Lab, uh, the OpenNet Initiative, uh, Measuring Internet Censorship and Surveillance. So to start, as I said, my name's Adam. I'm a researcher at Citizen Lab. Um, and we're an interdisciplinary research group who focuses on uh, digital security uh, and human rights uh, and communication technology. So what is the OpenNet Initiative Project? Uh, the OpenNet Initiative Project was formed in 2003 uh, and is a collaboration between three institutions, the Citizen Lab at University of Toronto, where I work, as well as the Berkman Center uh, for Internet and Society at Harvard University and the SecDev Group based in Ottawa. So what do we do? Uh, our, our mission is to investigate, expose, and analyze internet filtering and surveillance practices in a credible and nonpartisan fashion. So I'll get into that more specifically. Um, during a lot of the discussion yesterday, we talked about what, what is the role for the internet in uh, promoting democracy and, and citizen participation. But I think a lot of that discussion presupposes that the internet is a level playing field for all users in all countries. Um, and I think we, we know that, that that just isn't true. Um, that's one of the, the goals of the Open Ed Initiative Project is to show how the experience of the internet is different depending on where you are, what country, and what country you're in. The very simple research question f um, that guides the Open Ed Initiative is, is the internet experience, the internet I experience uh, in Canada or in the United States, the same uh, to user experiences, say, here in France? What about Thailand or Ethiopia, Belarus, China? Um, Although it sounds like a very simple question, uh, what we've learned is it's actually a very challenging one to answer from a variety of perspectives. Uh, and in addition, uh, the, the answer to that question obviously has some very significant uh, consequences for, for democracy and citizen engagement. First, I'll just explain what are the specific goals of the Open Initiative Project. Um, the first is increasing transparency. Uh, in many cases, the laws and regulations which govern uh, how the internet is uh, censored or not censored in a given country um, are either obscure or hidden, uh, not, not transparent to the average user. We hope that by generating a, a documenting an empirical research base, we can help uh, shed light on how censorship is applied in a, in a given country, if so. We also find in many cases that uh, the theory of how censorship is applied and, and the practice of censorship are often in conflict. Uh, so the stated reasons a, a, a government may give um, for censoring content or the content, the content that they describe as what, what is their target of censorship um, may conflict with what is actually censored in reality. Um, so one of the goals here is to sort of shed light on the, the gulf between uh, the content that uh, states may admit to censor or acknowledge censoring and what is actually censored. Uh, the second goal is to inform. Um, we're not a, an advocacy organization, but we see one of our roles as to provide a, a credible, nonpartisan um, base of empirical research that can help inform uh, advocacy efforts and poli public policy making processes. Uh, in many cases, that's something that's lacking from a lot of the debate is a real um, empirical research base that can help properly inform how, uh, how these discussions take place. Uh, and finally, capacity building. Um, we've generated a number of uh, formal networks, which I'll talk about a bit later, uh, of researchers, especially focused on the Global South. Uh, in our experience, actors in the Global South, researchers and uh, practitioners, um, often don't have, don't have the same seat at the table uh, as, people, as people here, um, and often their voices are not heard. So one of, one of our key efforts is to build the capacity of researchers working in the Global South who are faced with censorship and cybersecurity issues. Uh, in their country. Uh, and as a result, we've actually been able to uh, build a, a really great, rich um, network of advocates and researchers and academics and practitioners who work on freedom of expression issues uh, all over the world. Uh, and that's been a really invaluable resource uh, to this project. So how do we study internet censorship? Um, it sounds very straightforward, but what we try to do is take a multidisciplinary approach. To, help, to studying this field. Um, there's no shortage of, of individual groups or researchers who say study uh, the technical impacts of how, how is censorship implemented from a technical perspective, a computer science perspective, or, or, or the uh, a policy analysis on a, a country's um, uh, online censorship. But what we find in many cases is if we, uh, if we don't bridge the divides between those two different, or those many different uh, aspects, um, we're not painting a, a, a holistic, complete picture uh, of both how censorship is applied and what the impacts are. 
So technical research can tell us this is how uh, this website is censored, for example. Um, but it can't tell us why. It can't tell us what the impact is. Why was that site targeted, for example? Um, so we hope that by combining a legal and policy analysis with a political science research, with computer science and engineering, uh, and contextual social and cultural field work, we can sort of paint a more complete picture uh, of internet freedom in a given country. So what are our documented impacts and results? Uh, first, we've been uh, conducting this research for 10 years now. Um, and uh, we've been able to test for censorship uh, in 75 different countries around the world. Uh, we're one of the first uh, large organizations to conduct this research, and as a result, we have one of the largest collections of data of anyone on uh, internet censorship uh, around the world dating back 10 years. Since we're based in an academic institution, of course, what we do is we publish. Uh, we've uh, published three edited volumes uh, we call the Access Series, Denied, Controlled, and contested, uh, which contain both country profiles uh, outlining uh, freedom of expression in, in those 75 countries, um, as well as a number of uh, edited chapters uh, by various, various contributors. And uh, the full text of all of those books is available for download on oniaccess.net. As I said, we've, uh, throughout the 10 years, we've published hundreds of uh, specific country profiles, of, of regional profiles, uh, special bulletins and reports, case studies, uh, and journal articles, uh, all of which can be found on the website of the OpenNet Initiative, opennet.net. As I mentioned earlier, we've created two research networks, uh, OpenNet Asia and OpenNet Eurasia, um, which are collections of researchers based in those regions uh, who focus on uh, online freedom of expression issues uh, in, that, in those specific regions. Those are an extremely valuable resource. As I said, we like to inform, uh, we hope that our research can inform uh, advocacy and public policy efforts. Uh, our, our research is uh, cited quite widely. Uh, one example, uh, advocacy efforts, the, the Freedom House, Freedom on the Net report uh, relies heavily on our testing data and information on uh, censorship uh, and our uh, Censorship data is also used as an indicator uh, with the Millennium Challenge Corporation in the United States uh, on, uh, as an indicator of freedom of expression online. Uh, we've had a response from public, uh, private sector actors as well. Uh, in 2011, we published a report uh, on the use of Western technology, uh, um, technology made in the United States and Canada in this case, uh, being used for national level censorship of the internet in uh, you know, the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, one of uh, the findings of that report was that an American company called WebSense um, was, their technology was being used in Yemen for national level political censorship. Uh, after the publication of our report, uh, WebSense responded to this, um, said they didn't know this was happening. Um, they immediately cut off access to the device uh, in Yemen uh, and as a result of sort of re-clarified their policy that, that their technology is not to be used for, for this purpose. So we've been studying this for 10 years. Uh, of course, on the internet, it's a, a generation, many generations. Uh, what has changed over the course of those 10 years? And what have the impact uh, of these changes been um, for citizen participation and online freedom of expression? First, the scope of censorship. When we first started in 2003, only a very small handful of countries filtered the internet. Um, by 2013, uh, we've been able to document 42 uh, countries who filter some form of content, and of course that only underestimates the number uh, of total countries. Uh, so we see from just a small, um, small handful of countries originally doing this, it's really become a, a pervasive global norm uh, for censorship of the internet. The depth of filtering, uh, in addition, has changed. We see the, uh, an evolution in the methods used to filter content. There's an increasing technical sophistication um, and we see a growing role of non-technical means, so legal and policy and regulatory mechanisms used around the world to, uh, to restrict what citizens can say online. We see a change in the form um, of, how, of how censorship and surveillance are applied. Uh, we see censorship and surveillance as being uh, just parts along a spectrum of uh, what we call information controls, uh, attempts to manipulate uh, deny and disrupt access to information online. So we see the growing role of uh, uh, things like denial of service attacks to make to render websites inaccessible uh, and targeted malware attacks um, 
to perform targeted surveillance on sensitive, sensitive individuals and groups. Uh, as well, we see an expanding of the motivation and rationale for why states uh, censor. Um, we see uh, uh, motivation of uh, uh, protecting national security, that's fairly common. Uh, protect, uh, preventing child exploitation, that's a fairly universal uh, motivation for, uh, for censorship, as well as other, other motivations, protecting public morality, uh, protecting economic interests, uh, as well as restricting hate speech. Uh, aside from those um, stated motivations, we of course know in reality one of the primary roles of censorship is to silencing dissent, to restricting speech, uh, and citizens' ability to communicate online. Importantly here, we also see a, in, a decrease in the transparency in many cases of how internet censorship and surveillance are applied. Um, in many cases, especially in the early uh, days of our research, uh, if you went, if you attempted to, in, a, in a given censored country to access a website that was forbidden, you got a very clear message on your screen. This, web, this website is not accessible. And maybe some of you, of course, have experienced these. Um, and it, it may even say, uh, by order of the Ministry of Communications, uh, law, this, this particular law, this content is not accessible. Um, click here to email if you think this website should be recategorized. For a very transparent filtering of, of information. Um, we find that's not always the case. That does remain in many countries, but it, uh, in many others, uh, tr filtering is not transparent. Uh, and it may be very challenging for users to distinguish between a deliberate act to censor content and simple technical errors. From the perspective of the user, uh, the website may simply be down. So we see an increase in, uh, a decrease in how, how transparent filtering is. Uh, we also see a decrease in the transparency of what technology is being used. Um, in many countries around the world, it's uh, hardware and software produced by manufacturers, particularly in the United States and Canada, um, which are being used to censor this content. Um, those same block pages I mentioned earlier that uh, tell you that a website is inaccessible, in some cases had the logo of the company that, that made the device. Um, that's quite rare now. Uh, in many cases, uh, they've changed, changed the content of those pages to not not indicate what, what company may be responsible, uh, and in some cases go to great lengths to make sure that the companies are not known uh, who are responsible for this. On a very related note, uh, we see a decrease in accountability for the censorship. There is a growing reliance on private sector actors in implementing censorship uh, on a few fronts. Um, in many cases, governments will essentially down download responsibility for implementing censorship and designing censorship uh, onto internet service providers and platforms, uh, leaving it up to those ISPs uh, to determine what is censored and how it is censored. Uh, in other cases, um, it is the, we see a, a reliance on the manufacturers of the technology that is used to perform the censorship. Uh, in many cases, as I mentioned, it's, it's Western companies, it's American and Canadian companies uh, primarily who design the hardware and software uh, that's used to censor content. Uh, and in many cases, those systems are also used to categorize content. Um, that, of course, leaves the citizens of the countries uh, affected uh, with little, little role, uh, route for accountability if we're essentially relying on private sector actors to dictate uh, what speech is acceptable online. So we see a real um, decrease in accountability on that front. We also see a change in the timing of how censorship and surveillance are applied. So rather than uh, an image of a static censorship regime that is in place all the time and, and doesn't really change very much, what we see is highly dynamic censorship and filtering. We've, we've uh, coined the term just-in-time filtering, uh, which is the application of censorship uh, when, during a sensitive time period, when that information may matter the most. Um, the most common examples of this are during elections, a very uh, specified time period in many countries um, Sites that had not been censored before the election, just leading up to the election and during the crucial, say, the week of the election, uh, sites mysteriously become inaccessible or uh, experience attacks from, uh, from outside parties. Uh, when the election is finished, th that disappears. Um, we see this again during uh, protests and periods of civil unrest. Um, of course, there's the extreme examples we've seen in Syria and Egypt in the last several years, which is a complete disconnection of the country from the internet. Uh, those are extreme examples. In many cases, it's much, much more subtle than that. Um, but many events can be targeted. Sensitive political anniversaries uh, in China, for example, are a very, very 
frequently targeted time uh, for increases in censorship and surveillance, uh, and political scandals, uh, things of that nature. So what are the challenges and difficulties we faced in conducting this research? Uh, number one is research for security. Uh, the method that we use, uh, I haven't gone into much technical detail, but the method we use involves researchers who have uh, software we've, we've designed on a laptop or on their computer in, physically in the country of interest. This isn't research we conduct remotely from Toronto or Harvard. It's done in the country of interest. Um, and the methods, the technical methods that we use, uh, really what they try to do is to duplicate the experience of the average user. It's, um, what does a user see when they sit down on an average residential ISP, for example, at their home? Um, and fortunately, uh, throughout the 10 years of the project, we've never had a research uh, participant um, encounter any legal or security issues. Um, but of course, just the, the fear, mere fact of conducting this research in some countries is really a legal and political gray area. We don't believe it's formally against the law anywhere, but um, certainly if you had a, a sensitive individual attempting to expose the censorship regime of a given country, uh, that, could, that could lead to problems. Similarly, we've had concerns about releasing data uh, for, uh, for similar reasons. Um, of course, we wish, uh, we, we want to be able to release as much data publicly as possible, um, but we've had concerns early on that doing so would help censors target the users who participated. Uh, if we released full, uh, full data that we gathered during this research, it would be theoretically possible for them to look back and find who was this person who did this research and, and target them that way. Similarly, we were uh, concerned about providing a roadmap for censors. Uh, if we released a, this was what the early thinking was, if we released a list of, of uh, uh, several thousand websites that we suspected may be censored in a country and said, oh, well, you, you missed, they didn't, they didn't censor these, we're simply just informing censors how well a job they're doing, which wasn't something we were interested in doing. So that, those were early concerns um, we had. Uh, in executing this research. Second, with, with all technical research, there are technical problems. Um, one of the main issues is, is scaling. Um, we have been able to test in 75 different countries, but maintaining uh, this global network, essentially, of, uh, of researchers who can conduct tests when the, there really is a human element to this research is very challenging, uh, particularly in the, you know, the resources of an academic research project. We rely very heavily on uh, locally informed uh, contextual research and uh, sort of maintaining uh, that data uh, globally is, very, is, qu is quite a challenge. It's very difficult to scale a small project to the global scale. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the methods uh, and techniques used for censorship and surveillance continue to evolve. So uh, developing uh, measurement methods that can keep pace with these technological changes is quite challenging. Uh, finally, the last one of the challenges is the rise of surveillance. Um, censorship is often a more straightforward technical question to study. Um, however, we, of course we know certainly in the last six months surveillance is, is really the, one of the key issues for most people at this point and uh, surveillance is inherently more difficult to study if, it's, if surveillance is executed well, let's say, uh, it's virtually invisible to the individual who's under surveillance. Uh, and as a result, it makes, uh, makes it much more challenging uh, for us to, to, to document this practice. So what are the basic lessons learned uh, from this project and how would they, how do they uh, impact the, the rights of citizens to express themselves online? The first some very simple takeaway, censorship is, is spreading. Um, there is an increase in censorship, as I mentioned, from a small handful to at least 42 that we've documented who censor some form of content. Um, we see a, a, a continual evolution from a very small number of countries to really a, a global norm uh, for censoring content. Second, the methods are evolving. Uh, countries continue to develop new technical methods uh, and non-technical methods of restricting content, uh, making it increasingly challenging for citizens uh, who wish to circumvent those, those uh, methods of censorship, uh, raising additional challenges for them. And lastly, one of the most important ones we think today is um, the role of the private sector in facilitating uh, this censorship. As I mentioned, many of the uh, companies who cr create the hardware uh, export these this technologies around the world, and in, in particularly in North America, there's, um, there's little stopping them from doing this, essentially. Uh, there are, I mentioned the example of WebSense, who did respond. Uh, other, other companies uh, we've been in direct contact with um, 
really don't give us much. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't seem to respond. They, they have no stated policies against uh, their devices and technology used for political censorship uh, in a repressive regime. Um, and that's, you know, to say nothing of the role of, of targeted surveillance pro uh, products, which we've, we've talked about. Uh, um, so we really what we see is sort of a growing reliance on the private sector to determine what's available and what's not available. Uh, and I th we think that's a, a particularly important area for further discussion, certainly. Uh, so some brief plans for the future. These are the Citizen Lab projects. Um, we're currently working on a project called Internet Censorship Lab. <laughs> Sounds very similar, but really what we're doing is creating a new platform for making censorship to sort of accommodate some of those difficulties I mentioned earlier of scaling measurement, um, uh, measurement platforms to the global level. Uh, in addition, we have a new uh, network, about a year old, um, called the Cyber Stewards Network. Uh, this is a, a group of cybersecurity researchers and academics and practitioners uh, and advocacy uh, groups, um, all based in the Global South, uh, who are together as part of our, our Cyber Stewards Network to, to increase uh, the voice, essentially, of, the, of actors in, in the Global South in these debates. Um, I don't have it on the slide here, but one of our other key areas of focus uh, relates to the role of private sector actors in, in um, exporting censorship and surveillance technology. One of the key areas we focus on now um, is attempting to develop ways to fingerprint and identify technology, um, both censorship devices around the world um, as well as targeted uh, surveillance malware. Uh, devices like FinFisher and, and such, if you've heard of these. Um, that's one of the real ongoing active efforts uh, at the Citizen Lab, especially w working on methods uh, for identifying and uh, fingerprinting these technologies. Uh, thank you very much. That's my presentation. If you'd like to know more about the Open Initiative, all of the information I've talked about is on our website, opennet.net. And uh, thank you for your time. Merci beaucoup.